Landing something on the surface of Mars just isn't that easy. As recent as 2016, the European Space Agency's lander crashed into the surface due to a sensor malfunction. Now, if we want to be able to safely put people on the surface of the red planet, then we have to understand what some of those challenges are. So what has NASA and the Russian Space Agency done in the past to safely land people? And what have we done with robots? Let's talk about that. So one of the main challenges of landing something on a planet or a moon is having to go from the high orbital velocities that you are going to basically standing still on the surface. Now, that means you have to lose a lot of energy in that process. So there are two main methods of slowing you down, and the first one is aerodynamic forces or aerobraking. Now, aerobraking is really efficient here on Earth. It actually takes the spacecraft from going from 79,000 miles per hour down to 22 miles per hour going throughout the entire atmosphere by using heat shields, parachutes, and aerodynamic methods efficiently. Now there are a couple issues with aerobraking, the first one being heat. As you slow down, that energy has to go somewhere and it basically is converted to high temperatures around the spacecraft. That is why a lot of spaceships like the Space Shuttle, the Orion capsule, require high heat shields. Now the other issue is high g-forces, or the acceleration that you'll feel as a person in the spacecraft. Now since your velocity is slowing down so rapidly, you feel constantly like you're being pushed down, almost like you're on a roller coaster or a plane taking off. Now this is a problem because if it gets above 8 or 9 g's or 8 or 9 times the gravitational force of Earth, then that's when your body could start to break down. So that's a big thing to consider when trying to land on Mars. Now aerobraking techniques are a little bit more difficult on Mars, and that's due to the lack of atmosphere. For example, the Curiosity rover had a series of aerobraking techniques such as a heat shield and parachutes, which is able to bring it from its 13,000 miles per hour orbital velocities down to 225 miles per hour close to the surface. However, that's still too fast to land. So this is when we introduce the next technique, which is retropropulsion or a powered landing. Now how does a powered descent work? By pointing your thrusters in the direction of motion and firing them, you'll then create a force that pushes on your spacecraft in the opposite direction of motion. Therefore, you'll slowly accelerate yourself and slow yourself down as you reach the surface. Now, a powered descent is most popularly known for landing on the moon in the Apollo missions. The lunar module, or LEM, used a power descent to go from its orbital velocity down to the surface of the moon. And that's just because the moon has a negligible atmosphere. Therefore, it can't use any aerobraking techniques whatsoever. So all the change in velocity that's required has to be exhausted through an engine or through a rocket. Now one of the main issues with power descent is that it takes a lot of fuel. It actually requires 18,000 pounds of fuel in order to land the lunar module on the surface of the moon. And that's about 55% of the entire mass of the system. Over half the mass of the lunar module was just propellant to try and get it on the surface. Now it turns out that the moon's gravity is only about 16.5% of Earth's gravity and Mars's gravity is only 38% of Earth's gravity. Therefore, it would take over two times the amount of energy or fuel to land on the surface of Mars if you just use a power descent. Therefore, it would be around 75 to 90% of the mass of the lander would have to be fuel, which is pretty inefficient. So the best technique is using a combination of the two. So let's go back to our example. The Curiosity rover was able to go from 17,000 miles per hour down to 225 miles per hour just by using aerobraking techniques. The final stages were all done by a powered descent. Once it hit 225 miles per hour, retro rockets then thrust out of the bottom of Curiosity, slowing it down to about one to two miles per hour. Then it was able to lower Curiosity rover on a sky crane and then safely put it on the surface at again about one to two miles per hour. Now it turns out by using aero braking with the heat shield and parachutes, it actually made the entire system 40 times more efficient. By using retro rockets just at the end, that used only 2.4% of the amount of fuel it would have taken if you tried to do a power descent the entire way, which would have saved a lot of mass and cost a lot more if you wanted to do an entire power descent. Now if we're going to send people to the surface of Mars safely and efficiently, the best option is to use both aerobraking and retropropulsion. When SpaceX announced the Big Falcon rocket, they said that they will be able to lose 99% of their incoming orbital energy due to aerodynamic effects which means that they're gonna slow down from 7.5 kilometers per second all the way to 0.5 kilometers per second just by using heat shields, 
which is pretty phenomenal. And if it works, that will be extremely efficient in just having to use a small portion of the amount of fuel to actually land the spacecraft. In this episode, we talked about landing on Mars. We discussed aerobraking and power descents, why it's easier to land on Earth than it is on Mars, how the Apollo missions landed on the moon, and also what a couple rovers have done. Now, by using all that information, we can kind of develop what we need to do to land people on Mars, but that's still to come. In the next episode, we're going to talk about where exactly we need to land on the surface to be most efficient, and what are some of the challenges where we land. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.